welcome to Kennesaw State University and uh, discourse with uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins. I'm Dr. Khalil Elion from the English Department, Senior Lecturer of English. And uh, I just wanted to welcome you all to this uh, very inspiring, insightful event, a uh, foray into a world of uh, logic and rationality. Uh, tonight, uh, I'd like to give a special thank you uh, to Brian Klein, uh, to uh, Dr. Dawkins uh, and his agent Robin, uh, and to the entire uh, group of people who made this happen, especially Brian Klein, who's a student of mine, who worked tirelessly, and I mean that literally, uh, almost single-handedly spearheading this event. Uh, and this university, uh, the city of Kennesaw, uh, the entire Atlanta metro area community owes him uh, our thanks. Um, we should look at events like these as, uh, to borrow from Frank Capra, uh, honoring heroes who basically are lighthouses uh, in a foggy world. So let's keep those lighthouses lit. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Brian Klein. I'm the president of KSU Atheist United. It's a pleasure to have you all here. And I just want to first come out here and say thank you to all of you who came out. Um, give yourselves a round of applause. We definitely, this is going to be a life-changing night that you will not forget. You're going to be glad you came out. Uh, this only, you know, Dawkins is only in, in America for a few days a year. And we as college students and people who are, who are interested in investigating these very tough matters, um, no matter where on the Dawkins scale or what you believe as far as your ideologies, um, Dawkins challenges our, our, our minds. Um, I definitely want to thank a few people my, myself um, beyond the audience members. Um, I want to thank Jennifer Messer at Student Life. I want to thank all of the members at, of KSU Atheist United who helped me out with all this. Um, I want to thank my uh, former wife, Stacy here. I want to thank... Um, I also want to thank Dr. Sanzevero um, and all of my advisors. Um, next, I want to dedicate my time speaking tonight to uh, William Gavreau. Um, William, um, Matthew, Matthew William Gavreau, he has loved ones here tonight. Um, he's a KSU Atheist United member that we lost this year. Um, he's sorely missed and dearly loved, and he'll never be forgotten. Um, next, I want to say uh, just a real quick word about uh, Dr. Dawkins. I mean, how can one man come out here in a few minutes? Because I know you didn't come out here to hear me speak, did you? You know, but I mean, how am I supposed to go over everything that uh, Dr. Dawkins has done in his lifetime in a few minutes? Um, he's a member of the Royal Society. Um, he's, he's a professor emeritus of evolutionary biology at, at uh, Oxford University. Um, he's a best-selling author. But most of all, again, he makes us think. He makes us challenge the solipsistic things in our mind. And um, I think that's the greatest thing about him. He's a personal inspiration to me. Um, his foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, has helped me so much. I definitely want to thank uh, Robin and Stephanie, who uh, spent a lot of time uh, putting this event together, along with Jennifer Messer at KSU. And, uh, and I definitely want to thank the Bailey Center here, too, because I think they've done a phenomenal job. I want to thank the KSU Bookstore for selling out here, too. Um, I also want to thank um, the Openly Secular Project. You know, um, we at KSU Atheist United are a growing uh, atheist group. Um, we definitely uh, try to promote an atypical type of atheism where we want to be inclusive instead of exclusive um, for um, our fellow um, scholars here at KSU. Um, and um, next, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Sanzavero, who will be introducing or uh, interviewing Dr. Uh, Dawkins. Uh, Dr. Sanzevero holds uh, degrees in uh, philosophy, education, and religion from Emory U University. Um, he's also the Dean of Students here at Kennesaw State University, which basically makes him, in effect, the Vice President. Um, Dr. Sanzevero um, helped me personally this year. Um, I was going through um, some tough uh, health crisis, and uh, he's also helped me with this event, obviously. And uh, Dr. Sanzevero is a great guy, and uh, he's the perfect man to uh, interview um, Dr. Dawkins tonight with a question and answering. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn this over to uh, Dean Sanzevero and uh, Richard Dawkins. Thank you very much.
That must be this southern courtesy that I hear so much about. <laughs> Well, I, I was presuming the standing ovation was for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, uh, first, thank you all so much for being here. It is such an honor uh, to see uh, a wonderful packed house, um, to have this great evening together with Professor Dawkins um, to discuss uh, a variety of topics that are on our minds and hopefully will be on your minds as well. Uh, just a little bit about the format for this evening. Uh, you should have all gotten cards as you came in for those of you who wanted to submit a card, submit a question on the card. Um, and there will be um, volunteers who will be coming through the audience who will be collecting those cards. And then all of those cards will then uh, be brought up um, onto stage. Um, obviously, there may be more questions than we have time to answer. Um, so we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Um, and certainly, we're also going to look at some of the core themes uh, as we go through with those cards. But the volunteers will be coming up the aisles, um, and so we'll get those cards uh, a little later. And we'll give you a little bit of a cue when we're ready to start collecting those. But in the meantime, start getting those cards prepared. So to, to start off, let's start talking a little bit about your autobiography. Uh, tell me a little bit about that experience and what you think of the core themes um, that you wanted to convey in your autobiography. I was commissioned to write an autobiography, and I set off to write it. And uh, when I got, um, I was doing it chronologically. And when I got to uh, the age of 35, which was when I wrote my first book, The Selfish Gene, I felt the need for some results, for a bit of feedback. So I asked the publishers whether they'd mind if I split the book in half and uh, published the first half as a separate book, and that's the one that's now available. Have we got a ringing in the, in the speakers? Is it? Okay. Um, so, An Appetite for Wonder is the first half of the autobiography. The second half will be published next year. And I did do the first half entirely chronologically, sort of starting before I was born and then uh, going through the, my gestation and um, uh, conception and things like that. Um, and, um, and then childhood from when I could remember, which was the age of about two, uh, through school days, uh, university, um, a spell that I had in Berkeley, California for two years as a very junior assistant professor, and then back to Oxford where I was educated and my life um, as, as starting to do research there. And then I wrote The Selfish Gene, and that's where the book stopped. So that's purely chronological. Volume two, I realized chronological wouldn't really work. Um, it, it, it's somehow it's easy to do it chronologically when you're dealing with childhood. But when I got to adulthood, most of my adult life is necessarily that interesting. Um, some of it's too interesting. And so I wanted to cut that out. <laughs> Um, and uh, um, so it, the second volume is organized thematically, not chronologically. So I've got themes like television, publishers, uh, my life as a teacher, uh, my Christmas lectures, visits to Japan, things like that. So they're only roughly chronological, and, and it's actually several different chronologies going on together. And I think that works reasonably well. So the first volume which is the one that's available now, is chronological up to the age of, of, of 35. Are there any, um, any elements that you'd like to give us a, a little sneak preview on that's coming out in the next volume? Oh, um, let me think. Um, hmm. Well, uh, I, I just mentioned my visits to Japan uh, which were immensely enjoyable, all except for the food, because I'm very squeamish about things that are raw, let alone, <laughs> let alone still alive, which, which, which they sometimes are. Um, uh, what can I say about that? Um, we, um, uh, my wife went with me, Lala went, went with me, and um, I, I, what it was was a a replay of the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures. This is a thing that, that goes back to the days of Michael Faraday in London. Every year, a scientist gives a series of lectures for children. Uh, and they're called the Christmas Lectures. They happen at Christmas time. And uh, 
there's a tradition that you don't have slides, what you have is demonstrations, and the children have to come up and uh, take part in demonstrations, rather like a conjurer bringing people up to assist with a trick. And um, the, if, for the last few years, the Christmas lectures have been exported to Japan the following summer. And they're still called the Christmas lectures, although they happen in June. And uh, so I went out, there was a whole sort of circus of it went, went out, complete with demonstrations. And one of the demonstrations we had was a live python. Um, and uh, we were warned, well, the, the, the python came in a box labeled live turtles. <laughs> And th this was because if it had said live snake, it would, the, the postal workers would have refused to handle it. And it came packed in frozen Brussels sprouts to keep it cool. But um, we couldn't get a Japanese child to stand up and handle the, the snake. So Lala walked on with the snake coiled around her body. Uh, and the, the warmth of her body livened it up no end and it escaped, <laughs> much to the horror of the Japanese children. And so <laughs> Lala and I were chasing around trying to catch this, this, this snake. That was one incident. And another incident there was um, we had praying mantises uh, in a tank on the, on the stage, and we had a television camera, a video camera pointing at the tank and I was talking about the praying mantises, and then I finished talking about the praying mantises, but I forgot that the television camera was still on, on them. And I went on to something else, and I became aware that I was losing the attention of my audience. They didn't seem to be listening to what I was saying, and I noticed that their eyes were kind of bulging towards the screen. And so I looked up, and there was the female praying mantis munching happily on the head of the, of the male. <laughs> who was copulating with her all the more vigorously <laughs> for the removal of his inhibitory centers, which is what, um, which reminds me that one of my colleagues, uh, Michael Hansel at Oxford, was working on caddis flies, which you know, sm small insects which have very nice larvae. And he was trying to breed them, and he was failing to, to breed them. He couldn't get them to breed in the, in the lab. And the professor of entomology was sitting in the front row, a rather, a rather grumpy man. And he growled, haven't you tried cutting their heads off? And apparently that was, that's the way to get an insect to, to, re, to remove its inhibitions and become, and become potent or whatever is the equivalent <laughs> of insects. And another thing that happened in Japan, well, should I tell this, you know, I can tell this story, I think. Um, uh, the, the chairman uh, who, who, who introduced me, sort of the equivalent of, of, of Clive, um, said, when you have finished lecture, you must say, thank you very much, and I will know to initiate the crapping. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, next, the, next day's, the next day's lecture, um, he was also the the, the, the chairman, and he said more or less the same thing again. Um, I, I did have a slide, I, I did have some slides, and the projector broke down, and, uh, which was a bit of a shame, and so I, while the technicians were working to fix the projector, I, I went on talking without the slides, and then after about five minutes, the projector was fixed, and everybody burst into clapping, uh, and the chairman said, was good thing projector broke down, because when was fixed, audience was moved to crap on you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, it sounds like we have a lot to look forward to in this next edition. <laughs> I think I'm gonna to have to cut those stories out. They, 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 won't, they won't translate. Well, let's start to talk a little bit about uh, your foundation and, and certainly yes. the amazing work that it's done for the international secular community. Uh, as you think about kind of a, a crowning achievement uh, of the foundation and where we go from here, what the future looks like um, based on the influence of the foundation. Okay, it, it's called the, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. 
There are actually two. There's one in Britain and one in America with the same name and the same, uh, and the same aims. Uh, the British one is not that active at the moment. It exists mainly so that I can give money to, uh, to the American, they're both charities, to give one, to, I, I can give money to the American charity via the British charity, because for tax reasons, I'm not allowed to give money directly to the American charity. But it's the American charity which is most active, and it is actually very active now um, under the le leadership of Robin Blumner, who is, who is here tonight. Um, and I think that the crowning achievement is going to be the openly secular campaign, which is now up and running in a big way. And let me tell you a bit about it. Um, it is an unfortunate fact that in America, the prestige of religious non-believers is not high, to put it mildly. It seems to be more or less impossible to get elected to high office if you are a religious non-believer. Uh, I believe it's true to say that not a single member of the, single one of the 535 members of the United States Congress is openly secular at the moment. They all claim to be religious. That, of course, is a statistical nonsense. It can't possibly be true. Uh, there have got to be a very substantial number of liars. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't blame them. I don't blame them for lying because they won't get elected if they don't lie. So in other words, a major qualification to get elected to high office in this country is to be a liar. Uh, let's not be cynical about that. <laughs> I mean, one, 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 can make jokes, one can make jokes about lying politicians, and I, I, that's not what I'm doing. I'm saying that they are obliged, against their will, no doubt, to lie about their innermost convictions. And that is very unfortunate, but it is just symbolic of, of a whole attitude in, in American society. I get letters, my foundation gets letters from people saying that they, are, uh, they came out as a non-believer and were ostracized in their community. Uh, they lost their spouse, they lost their husband or their wife. Uh, they lost their parents, they lost their children. Um, they lost the respect of their community. Uh, over and over again, I, I wouldn't mind betting there are quite a few people in this audience who have stories along those lines to tell. And this is a terrible thing. It's discrimination. If you imagine somebody saying that you, it's impossible to get elected to Congress if you're female, or if you're gay, or if you're Jewish, it would be a scandal. And yet that seems to be the situation with respect to religious non-believers. So the Openly Secular campaign is a campaign to get Americans to come out as non-believers in such numbers that it will no longer be the stigma that it is, that politicians will no longer uh, feel that they have to lie in order to get elected. The number of non-believers in America is now about 20% which is a huge number, far exceeds the numbers of m most of these particular religions. Yet politicians are um, constantly currying the favor of minority religions to get the vote of wh whatever religion it is. Um, so we want to get people to, to come out as non-believers, as openly secular, and one of the things we're doing is doing very short films, maybe one minute films of people just facing the camera and saying, I am, whatever my, whatever my name is, I'm a postman, I'm a fireman, I'm an, I'm an flight attendant, uh, I'm, I'm a taxi driver, I'm a waiter, I'm a lawyer, whatever they might be, and I'm openly secular. And I'm obviously a nice person, I'm the sort of person you'd like to meet, I'm the sort of person you'd like to have a drink with, I don't have two horns and a tail. And, and, and we're getting a lot of, uh, of people to, to do this. And uh, it's, it's spending quite a lot of money on it, which is, which is coming from donors. Uh, and we hope that it will push 
America to a tipping point where suddenly everybody will, will, will realize a little bit like happened with the gay campaign. People will realize this is nothing unusual, this is a perfectly normal thing. And, and once the tipping point is reached, it, once the tipping point is reached, uh, it will be um, as if floodgates are opened and we shall have a more, um, uh, a, a more open society, a more, a more tolerant society. So as we think about atheism and its role in science, do you think that science requires atheism? Science clearly doesn't require atheism because there is a fair number of very good scientists who are not atheists. So that, that's an, an empirical matter. Uh, historically, of course, in historical, in, in earlier centuries, that was more or less universal. Before Darwin, it was rather difficult to be an atheist. Uh, nowadays, um, about 30% of American scientists are, are religious. Uh, if you look at the elite American scientists in the National Academy, the figure drops to about 10%. So there are about 10% of, of, the, of the National Academy are religious. Um, and obviously, they're in the National Academy, they're, they're very good, good scientists. And the same is true of the Royal Society in Britain, by the way, just about almost identical figure. The Royal Society being the, the equivalent body, the, the, the Academy of Elite Scientists. Um, as for what, ha what, what they actually believe, if you ask them, it sometimes turns out, I think rather often turns out, that they're not really religious in the sense of believing in a supernatural power, or believing in a virgin birth, or believing that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, but they will use language rather like Einstein, who was spiritual but didn't believe in a personal God. Einstein used the word God when he said things like, what really interests me is did God have a choice in creating the universe? What he meant by that was, is there only one way for a universe to be? Or are there lots of different possibilities for making a universe? But he expressed it using God language. He used God language when he said, but he does not play dice, meaning, but God does not play dice. Um, that was Einstein's way of saying he didn't believe in Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle, but he expressed it in God language, which I think was a bit unfortunate because it led people to think that Einstein actually did believe in a personal God and he was most adamant that he didn't. And I suspect that that may be true of a lot of so-called religious scientists, that they are spiritual. They, they feel a sort of, as I do actually, that when I look up at the stars uh, or when I look down a microscope, I feel a sense of almost transcendent wonder, uh, but I don't believe in anything supernatural. And I think that's probably true of many of the people who call themselves religious. That there are a few who really are religious and they really do believe in things like the virgin birth. And I, I, I can't fathom them out at all. <laughs> um, you have said that evolution allows individuals to be fulfilled atheists. What do you mean by that? Well, before Darwin, if you looked around the world, you would see the bewildering complexity of life. You would see birds flying and fish swimming and monkeys swinging through the trees and, and moles digging. And you would realize that these mechanisms, these narrow engines, as Sir Thomas Brown called them, these mechanisms are so beautifully apparently designed. You would have thought they've got to be designed. There would have been almost no question about it. You would have thought it, 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 it's not even worth thinking about any other possibility than that they were designed. Because a bird flies so beautifully and clearly everything about it is designed for flying. Everything about a dolphin is designed for swimming. Everything about an eye is designed for focusing a sharp image on a retina and uh, varying the focus, varying the stop, the opening of the, of the, of the eye. Um, so before Darwin came along, it was extremely hard to be religious. What you could do, which is what the great philosopher David Hume did among others, was to say this, the apparent design of living things is a bad argument for a designer 
for, for one thing, I mean, the most elementary thing is that it leaves the designer still unexplained, and the designer would have to be the same kind of thing, the same kind of complex, improbable thing as that which he's called upon to, to design. So it was always a bad argument, which a few philosophers saw, but Hume was unable to think of any alternative. If, I mean, Hume would have been delighted had he lived long enough to read The Origin of Species, but he didn't. So that's what I meant uh, when, when I said that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Before, before Darwin, you could be an atheist, but a very puzzled atheist. Uh, now, you've, you've made some pretty confrontational statements when it comes to religion. Um, and uh, I think one of the questions that often arises is the role of teaching religion to children um, and whether you would consider that to be tantamount to child abuse. I, I think that, that certain things are tantamount to child abuse. I think that teaching children about hell is child abuse. I think terrifying children with a sort of ultimate punishment that goes on forever uh, is, is, is child abuse. I think that um, tying a label around a child's neck that says, because your parents are, let's say, Catholic, therefore you are Catholic. I think that's a milder form of child abuse. Um, you would never, because the parents of a child were logical positivists, you would never say, this is a logical positivist child. Or if the parents were existentialists, you would never say, this is an existentialist child. Or if the parents were Keynesian economists, you wouldn't say this is a Keynesian child. <laughs> and yet, our society, whether we're believers or not, quite happily buys into the language that says this is a Catholic child. And you will read statistics that say um, the numbers of Muslims in the world is so-and-so, and the number is, by the year 2030 is going to be so-and-so. And you see there's a hidden assumption there that the children of Muslims are going to be Muslims. And that may be a realistic assumption, but it's a presumptuous one. And I think it's an abusive one to the child. Instead of saying, let the child grow up and decide for herself what she believes, rather than uh, assume that the beliefs of her parents are going to automatically be inherited by her. But I don't think I've ever said that uh, bringing up a child religious is, is abusive. I think I've said that labeling a child with the religion of its parents is abusive. I'm all for religious education. I'm all for teaching children about religion because it's so important for understanding history, for understanding politics, for understanding warfare, uh, and for ap appreciating literature as well. It's, so it's very important to teach children about religion, but I think what is not a good thing is to teach a child, you are a Catholic child, or you are a Pentecostalist child, or you are a Muslim child. That, I think, is, is, is wicked. Now, looking at your critical view of certain religions, you seem to be particularly hard on Islam. I'm glad you noticed that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about why you, you single out Islam and, and treat them differently than other religions in your Well, um, this is a fairly recent thing. If, if you read The God Delusion, which is my main um, sally in this direction, Islam is not mentioned very much. I mean, it's, it's pretty much written, I mean, I, I was brought up in a Christian country, uh, in, a, in, in Christian schools, and so my, and, and indeed in Christian culture. I, I consider myself a cultural Christian in the same way as many people Many atheists will say I'm a cultural Jew. Um, so the God delusion is, is mostly aimed at Christianity, although it's, it, 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 could, it could be aimed at any religion and, and is aimed at any, any religion. Um, I suppose that, it, that if nowadays I talk more about Islam, it's because I'm genuinely horrified by the uh, extremes that I Islam can drive people to. And I must hasten to add, of course, that the vast majority of Muslims are perfectly decent people who wouldn't dream of cutting somebody's head off or their clitoris off. But 
um, th there is something about the religion which, uh, in its extreme form, is, is leading people to do horrific things. And I fear that we in the West are insufficiently aware of this. Uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who some of you may know of, who herself escaped from Islam in Somalia, became a member of parliament in the Netherlands and then and now lives here under, under armed guard. Um, she is deeply worried that, that America is, and, and the West generally, are sleepwalking in the face of the danger from militant Islam. It's, of course, ex expressed in its ex most extreme form that we've yet seen in the form of ISIS at the present in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and I think just about everybody has been horrified by seeing the pictures of people being beheaded and people being stoned to death for the crime of being raped. Imagine that. Um, the crime of uh, being seen out, of a woman being seen out and about without a male relative to accompany her. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, women aren't allowed to drive. Um, gay people are persecuted and sometimes executed for being gay. Um, this is orders of magnitude more horrible than anything that we see in the, in the West. And yet, my kind of people, decent, soft-hearted, liberal people, almost seem to be bending over backwards to be apologists for this kind of thing. It's almost as though we're saying something deeply patronizing and condescending, which is, of course, we here in the West don't do that kind of thing, but it's their culture. It's a kind of looking down on, on people with brown skin, condescending to them. It's a form of bigotry against them to say they, should be, they shouldn't be held to the same standard as we would, as, as, as we would in, the, in this country. So I, I am deeply offended by the uh, tendency of nice liberal people who I regard as my kind of person to bend over backwards to excuse the horrific things which are done to women in Islamic theocracies uh, and, um, as it were, make, make light of them. And so I suppose that's probably why I, at, at, at present, I mean, I've never written a book about Islam, but I, that's why you, you've gained the impression that, that I'm, I'm concentrating on Islam at the moment. Well, and I think keeping along that same theme, how, how do you interpret the global proliferation of fundamentalistic emotion and violence today? Well, it does seem to be a bit of a, an, of a new thing. It, it, it does seem to be something which, I mean, it's a bit of a back turn. In, I mean, I think there's a general, if you looked at history over, over centuries, we, th things are getting better on, on the long time scale. Stephen Pinker's book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, which I strongly recommend, um, documents the general improvement over centuries, even millennia. But it, it's not a straight upward curve, it's a, it's a, it's a sawtooth. And I think we are at the moment in a, in a dip in the sawtooth. Um, and there's, um, the, the Middle East is obviously the worst example, but there are some pretty extreme um, examples of, of Christian fundamentalist, um, I think it's called dominionism in, in this country. I strongly recommend, by the way, a book, which I've only just started reading, about a third of the way through it, uh, Christian Nation by Frederick Rich. Has anybody read that? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It's a, it's a dystopian fiction. It's a, it's a novel about the future if McCain had won the 2008 election. 
and, and then died. <laughs> and it's, um, it's a beautifully written novel. It's, it's, I, would, I would call it really quite great literature. It's a beautifully written novel. Uh, and the picture that he paints of, the, of President Palin yeah, you may laugh. <laughs> you may well laugh. Um, it, 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 it is something to, um, I mean, it, it, it didn't happen, but it's, it, it wasn't that far off happening. I mean, you know, the, the McCain-Palin ticket was not elected, but it came perilously close. And uh, anyway, I recommend that book, Christian Nation by Frederick Rich. Thank you. Uh, so the audience knows too, the volunteers have started collecting cards. So if you do have any cards and you want to make sure that your card gets collected, make sure to have it up and the volunteers will come to get it for you. <clears throat> okay, so from a physiological perspective, how much do you think the human brain has evolved from the Bronze Age humans to the present? Uh, we, you know, as, as you look at, we, you know, based on your response to the fundamentalism question, and we think about once upon a time people worshipped fire and the dead and Zeus and Yahweh, and yet um, there seems to be some little difference um, often between religion then and today. I don't think since the Bronze Age there's been really enough time to, to, um, for, for any significant biological evolution to have taken place. Um, cultural evolution is so much more powerful a force in, in, in humanity any, anyway. You can see it in the evolution of technology, the evolution of fashions, of music, of literature, of language. Um, this is really rapid, dramatic evolutionary change, and I think it's that that's really changed since the Bronze Age. If you were, if you were to um, bring back people from um, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, uh, and just educate them, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They, uh, they, you'd have to go back, oh, half a million years to, 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 sit, to notice a significant biological difference. Let's switch gears a little bit and uh, look at some of the controversy you've been stirring up a bit, even within the atheist community itself, regarding the role of women in feminism. Uh, and recently, there were comments made about women in Western societies, um, should not be concerned and talk about the sexism they encounter every day because there are women in countries who have it worse. Um, but don't you think that positions would apply to you sitting here uh, as, you're, as you're talking about the travails of atheism in Western secular-based societies uh, versus um, within atheist and autocratic theologies? I, I guess, uh, talk a little bit more about those comments. And yes, I, mean, look, I want to be clear about this. Um, when, when I say something like, um, this kind of maltreatment of women in, in America is bad, but the treatment of women in Islam is worse, I'm not saying the treatment of women in, in America is good. I'm just saying it's not as bad. Uh, and um, there, it, it, I, I got, get the feeling there are some people who can't tell the difference between, say, between sa saying that this is bad, but that's worse. They, they seem to think that I'm saying that this, this must be good because that's worse. And of course, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, the, the, the harassment of women in Western, I know, never mind about America, in, in, the, in the West generally, the harassment of women in, uh, in the workplace, in Western society, uh, is appalling. And if, for example, the uh, harassment, say the sexual, um, uh, fumbling, groping, assault is by a person in charge, in power, having a, having a powerful influence, say the woman's boss, that puts her in an appallingly difficult position uh, because she, uh, she may be in danger. I've actually known women, friends of mine, who have, who have lost their jobs because they have not submitted to the sexual advances of a boss. And this is appalling. And, I, and I've never said anything else. Um, what, what I have said is that however appalling that may be, 
having your clitoris cut off is worse. Uh, being forbidden to, um, to do, do anything without the supervision of a male relative might be, under some circumstances, worse, not under other circumstances. Being stoned to death for the crime of being raped, or as they would call it, uh, for the crime of adultery, is worse. But it's terribly important to understand that because something is worse, that doesn't mean that the first thing is good. That's bad too. And I'm deeply disturbed that, that some, of the, um, some of the remarks that I've made on, on Twitter have apparently, to my horror, been used to um, assault women in America with threats of rape and, and goodness knows what else um, because of a, mi of a misunderstanding of something that I've said. And I mean, that is truly appalling. And, uh, and uh, I, I um, have spoken out against that. Uh, but I, I, isn't it sort of obvious that the, this logical point that just because that is bad and that's worse, that's not saying that that's good? Isn't that bloody obvious? <laughs> So we're going to get a few questions from the audience momentarily. Um, but before we do, since, since you mentioned Twitter, um, and obviously the, the role that social media has played, uh, rather challenging communicating complex ideas in 120 characters. So talk a little bit about why you choose to use Twitter as one of your mediums. It is a challenge, and I think it's rather an interesting challenge. Um, it's... it's um, 140 characters is, is a difficult thing to convey a thought in. It's quite good for conveying a pithy little, little um, idea that you want to get a conversation going on. And I quite often do that. Uh, quite often, um, uh, just a, a little, little pensée, a little, a little reflection, which is designed to, to get um, thought thought going. I mean, I can't think of any examples now, but something about if I've gone for a walk and seen a leaf, as one does, um, and reflect that a, that a leaf is a solar panel, and then perhaps say something about, about that. That's, that's, I think, an interesting little, little thought to, to provoke. Um, sometimes I use them for jokes, like um, I, I, I once had a complaint that you always have to buy socks in pairs. So I had a, a, a little sock controversy going. Um, because, I mean, a sock is a sock. There's no such thing as a left sock and a right sock. So you shouldn't have to buy a pair of socks. And then you discover that all your pairs of socks have slightly different colors, and so you can't wear. You know, when you've lost one, you've, you then have to throw the other one away. Um, you should be able to buy a sack full of socks. Um, so, I mean, some of, some of my tweets are, are kind of humorous like that. And then I reflected that, well, Although socks don't have chirality, um, shoes do. You have left shoes and right shoes. But people who've only got one leg still have to buy a pair of shoes. <laughs> so I was thinking that we ought, to, we ought to be able to set up a social media club for one-legged people so that they could swap shoes. <laughs> that, that kind of thing. But, but, um, uh, but of course, I, I also use it for, for, more, for more serious points. I mean, commenting on... The, the daily news, that, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, 140 characters, it is a challenge. Um, it is vulnerable to misunderstanding, partly because you forget when you've got a, a series of tweets going and people are replying to them, you forget that plenty of people haven't seen the series so far. And so it's not like writing an article where you, you more or less you assume that if, if they've got down as far as paragraph four, they've probably read paragraph one. Um, they haven't, of course, in the case of Twitter. And, so, and that's a mistake that I've quite often made, for, forgetting that although I'm familiar with, the, um, with the, the story so far, to many people, the first thing they see is tweet number six. Um, and, and of course, that, that is highly vulnerable to misunderstanding. 
Well, we'll go ahead and we'll get a few questions up from the audience and while we're getting those up here, um, you did take a position against the philosopher Jack Derrida in relation to the Cambridge Honorary Doctorate incident. Um, what works of his did you study? And oh what did God, you I know nothing about him at all. I, when did I take a position against him? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know, that's a good question. I haven't read a word of Derrida. Oh my goodness, well, it is, then apparently, okay, I'm trying okay, to get my I notes in order here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well then um, we will move on to the other I, I mean, I've, 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 I've read, well, when I haven't read a, read a word of him, I, I have read paragraphs by, by Derrida and, just, and found them utterly incomprehensible. Um, <laughs> and I, I may in general, I tell you what I have done, I've, I've expressed skepticism about whether people of a certain school of thought in literary, literary studies, whether they really sincerely wish to be understood, or whether, or whether they are gaining prestige from the very fact that they are not understood. Um, I, I did meet a woman who, who said that she was talking to a philosopher at a party, and she said to him, I'm afraid I found your last book very difficult to understand. Oh, thank you, he said. <laughs> Peter Medawar, a great British biologist who's a great hero of mine, uh, speaking of uh, this kind of literature, said something like the following, and I may get it almost word for word right. Um, a recent article in the Times Literary Supplement suggested that ideas that are profound and difficult are best expressed in language that is deliberately obscure. What a preposterously silly idea. I'm reminded of an air raid warden in wartime Oxford who, when somebody complained that the blackout was not being properly observed, advised him to wear dark glasses. <laughs> uh, Medawa, I, I forget it, whether it was he who coined the phrase physics envy. Um, <laughs> physics is a genuinely, profoundly difficult subject. All of us look up to physicists. Physicists need to understand extremely difficult things, and if they want to convey it to lay people, they have to really struggle to make the language as simple as they possibly can. Could it be that there are other subjects which actually are not very profound, and therefore have to struggle in the opposite direction? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we, we appear to have some emerging themes in our questions here. So first, let's talk a little bit more about the theme of atheism and religion. Um, do you think the different religions of the world will someday find a way to reconcile their differences and work together? Could they somehow find common ground to unite? Or do you think they will forever be in strife with one another? Well, that's really a question you should put to them, not to me. I... I, I, um, I um, uh, I, I mean, I really have no time for any of them, a, a, apart from as historical interest. <laughs> uh, I, it would be of great benefit to humanity if they would get on well together, because while by no means all wars are caused by religious strife, if you look back in history, a pretty large number of them have been. Uh, and fighting over whose imaginary friend is better than whose imaginary friend <laughs> Uh, is a pretty silly reason to go to war. So um, it would, that would be desirable. But what, what would be really desirable would be if religion could be consigned to the dustbin of history. So is there any societal benefit at all that you think can be realized from religion? There are some very, very nice people who are religious. Some of my best friends are religious. Um, uh, and it's even possible that their religion makes them 
makes them nice, I, I, I suppose. There are some very nice atheists as well, uh, as the openly secular campaign will, will demonstrate. Um, no, I don't think that there's any very profoundly noticeable reason that in benefit that comes from, from religion, really none at all. So how would you recommend then that someone who wants to come out as an atheist, uh, how does one do that, particularly in a state like Georgia? Uh, <laughs> well, it, 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 different individual circumstances are so different. Uh, um, Many, many people have problems because of their of their family, and I deeply sympathise. I've had letters from from young people who are really deeply troubled because they've lost their faith, uh, perhaps because they've been to school and been to university and and <laughs> learned something. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> um, and they're terrified of, of offending their parents. They're not necessarily frightened of being thrown out by, by their parents, although that, that is the case some, sometimes. But they're frightened of offending their parents. They're frightened of hurting their parents. There's a, a YouTube film, which many of you may have seen, of a boy of about 15 um, telling his mother that he's become an atheist. Have you, have you seen this, this film? It's rather sad. Um, and. and um, uh, he, he's sort of hanging his head and saying, oh, Mom, I'm an atheist. Um, and she get, gets hysterical and, and she says, right, no Christmas presents for you. Um, <laughs> and you're going to see the bishop tomorrow. Uh, and um, th this sort of goes on. And the, the father is kind of slumped in his chair, looking kind of miserable. <laughs> I'm a little bit worried about who was doing the filming. It, it slightly <laughs> saps one's confidence in it because one no wouldn't normally think that a conversation like that would happen to be filmed. Um, so it may be bogus, it may be, it may be false, but it kind of looks authentic. And whether it's authentic or not, it, it, it chimes in with many of the letters that my web website, richarddawkins.net, gets from people who are from, yet from young people in, in this situation. It, it is very difficult. Most difficult of all, I suppose, is, is for clergy who've lost their faith, of which there are quite a large number. Um, another of the things that my American foundation does is to sponsor a website called The Clergy Project, which is for clergy people, clergymen and women, who have become atheists, but daren't admit it because it's their livelihood. Um, it's all they know how to do. Uh, and so we provide a website where they can go and talk to each other often anonymously, because they're actually genuinely frightened of being outed. So they go on, under a, a, often under a false name, they cry on each other's shoulders, they discuss their problems, they talk about the possibility of how they might come out. Uh, my original plan when thinking of this was more ambitious than just a website. I wanted to actually get enough money to endow um, retraining scholarships for clergy people so they could be retrained as counsellors or carpenters or, or, or something like that. Um, we didn't get enough money for that so uh, it, it was the website and, and that is being extremely successful. The number of clergy people who are now members of the clergy project is over 500 uh, and that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. It's based on research by Dan Dennett and Linda Lascola, uh, who've actually now written a book called Trapped in the Pulpit or something like that? Caught in the Pulpit? Anyone, anybody know it? Um, anyway, but Dennett and, and Lascola, and it's a, it's a very good book, interesting book, about these clergymen and women who've, who've given up their, their faith. And another um, good example is Dan Barker, who uh, was a clergyman. Mind you, being a clergyman in America is pretty easy. You don't need any training. You, <laughs> you just stick the word reverend in front of your name. And yeah, and then, and then you get your tax breaks. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, Dan Barker went on practicing as a clergyman 
for about a year after becoming an atheist and then finally got out and now runs the Freedom from Religion Foundation with his wife, Annie Laurie Gaylor. Um, so he's a, he's a success story. He's written uh, several books, including, I think, two books about his own escape from, uh, from religion as a, as a clergyman. Um, I forget what the question was, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll okay. move on to the okay. next one. So what do you think is the greatest obst obstacle to American atheism, and how do you recommend overcoming it? I think we've covered that with the openly secular thing. I, th I think it's the, it's the misconception that, that there's something wrong with, a with atheists, and this possibly stems from the very, very widespread misconception that you need religion in order to be moral, which is a really an astonishing uh, misconception when you think about it. Um, there's no evidence that, that religious people are any more moral than, than atheists, um, and nor is there any reason why they should be. Uh, if you think about why religious people might be more moral, I think there's only two possible reasons. One would be that they get their morality from scripture. Well, I think we all hope they don't. Uh, if you've actually read either the Bible or the Quran, um, you would not wish uh, that anybody should get their morals from there. There are a few nice bits. The Sermon on the Mount kind of stands out because there's not much else. Um, but um, mostly the, 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 mor the morality, the moral values, at least of the, of the Old Testament, are pretty much the same as the moral values which are now being enacted uh, from Quranic. From, the Quran, of course, is largely derived from the Jewish Bible um, in, in the Middle East. So you don't, get your, you, you don't want to get your morals from the Bible, and nor do you get your morals from the Bible, because um, nowadays, you know, we don't do slavery anymore. Nowadays, um, we, uh, we don't um, stone people to death for adultery, or at least we, apart from in Syria and Iraq and places. Um, so th there has been an enormous shift into the 21st century from earlier centuries. As you go through the centuries, moral values simply change. And the moral values change independently of whether you're, you're religious or not. I've made this point so many times, you may have seen me make it on YouTube or, or, or something. But the, the, the moral values of a 21st century American are completely different from the moral values of a 19th century American or, or, or Englishman. Um, if you go back to the 19th century and you look at the moral values of the most avant-garde, liberal, uh, progressive thinkers, uh, people like Abraham Lincoln, people like uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. They were ahead of their time. They were the most liberal, progressive thinkers of their time. But by modern standards, they were terrible racists and sexists and everything else. Things move on. We are, we are labeled. Our moral values are labeled by our, by our century, by our decade, almost. Um, so moral values simply don't come from the Bible. They come from the century in which you live. I'm not quite sure where, what actually causes the century in which you live to have certain moral values. It seems to be a, a complicated mixture of, oh, conversation, journalism, jurisprudence, uh, parliamentary dis discussions, um, almost as though there's something hovering in the air. Of course, there isn't anything hovering in the air, but, but the, the, the way people talk about and think about moral values today is just no, not just from the 19th century, it's different from what it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago. I think we all know this. So we don't get our morals from the Bible, and we shouldn't get our morals from the Bible. The only other reason I can think of why religious people might be more moral than atheists is that they're sucking up to God, which is a pretty terrible reason to be moral. Wouldn't you rather a person that you loved, a person that you wanted to get on with, was a good person because they're a good person rather than because they, they want to go to heaven and don't want to go to hell?
so shifting gears a bit to talk about evolution, what yes. what trends do you think that we're seeing in the evolution of humans, and, and what and, and where do you see this going in the next 10, 50, 100 generations? It's a very slow process. It's, it's, it's much slower than we're accustomed to dealing with. We're accustomed to dealing with a historical time scale. So we think in terms of decades. We talk about the 80s and the 90s and the 70s and the 60s. Um, and that's much, much too short a time to expect to see any evolutionary change. Um, you, you've got to start thinking in terms of not even thousands of years, but hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, before you're going to start it, to, to see any major change. So if you look back to three million years ago, two million years ago, we've got a lot of fossils. We know what our ancestors looked like. Uh, they had smaller brains than us, and they, um, there were the various other, other differences, but I suppose the swelling of the brain is the biggest change. And um, that must have meant, I suppose, that the bigger-brained individuals were better at surviving and reproducing. Uh, surviving is important, but reproducing, but surviving is only a means to the end of reproduction in, in the Darwinian world. So uh, there are various ideas for why a bigger brain might have helped you to survive. To many people, it seems pretty obvious. Um, there are some um, less obvious I ideas. Uh, one is that um, the big brain is a kind of cerebral peacock's tail, sexual selection, uh, braininess, intelligence is sexy uh, because of the way it manifests itself, perhaps in the form of, of um, uh, having the gift of the gab or, or um, remembering the steps of a complicated ritual dance or something of that sort. So that's one possibly slightly more specialist reason why be, be having a bigger brain was an advantage. Another is the so-called Machiavellian intelligence theory, that the, the main barrier to success in, our, in human society is other humans. We're constantly competing with each other. And you need to be cunning, uh, you need to be devious, you need to be a good dece deceiver and so on, uh, in order to do well, to survive, and above all to get lots of sexual partners in primitive society. So that's Machiavellian intelligence. And maybe just simply the intelligence to, to survive, to find food, to, to, um, to, to do all the things that are necessary to, 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 to survive. So increasing brain size is what you see from the past as the main trend for the last three million years. For the next three million years, will the brain go on swelling? In order for that to happen, it would be necessary either that the brainiest individuals survive better, and in our society, everybody who wants to pretty much survives to adulthood. Anybody who wants to reproduce will, will have a chance to reproduce because we don't, on the whole, die of being mauled by a lion or something like that, like our ancestors did. So it really comes down to who has the most children. Um, natural selection is now a matter of favoring those who have the most offspring. And so in order for the brain to go on swelling, go on growing, it would be necessary that the brainiest individuals are the ones who have the most children. In The God Delusion, you mentioned that our ability to hold supernatural beliefs may not have evolved directly, but emerged through our evolution of one or more other traits. I was wondering if, this has been, if there has been any research into this, or if it's even possible to study this after the fact. Yes, I'm not sure about that. What, what you're, I think what you're referring to is um, people had often asked me um, whether I could think of a Darwinian advantage in religion. And my usual answer was not in religion directly, but in psychological characteristics which give rise to religion as a byproduct. And the kind of thing I was thinking of there was a tendency to obey your parents, a tendency to believe what your parents tell you or what your elders of your society tells you. And I think it's very easy to think of good Darwinian reasons why a child 
should believe its parents when its parents tell it seriously and earnestly. Things like, don't pick up snakes, um, don't go too near the cliff edge, uh, don't jump in the fire. Um, these are uh, pieces of advice to a child, which a child will be well advised simply to, ad to obey without question, rather than to put it to the skeptical experimental test. Um, so uh, what I'm talking about here then is a biological advantage in a psychological predisposition, tendency to believe parents. And once you've got that psychological disposition to believe your parents, then you will believe your parents even if they tell you nonsense, which they don't know is nonsense, of course, because there's no filter that says only believe sensible advice. If you knew what was sensible advice, you wouldn't need to be told. It's because you need to be told that you don't know what's sensible and what isn't. And therefore, if your parents tell you, don't uh, swim with the crocodiles, that happens to be good advice. But if your parent tells you, um, you have to face east and pr pray five times a day, for all you know, that's just as good advice as don't swim with the crocodiles. Uh, the fact that one is sensible and the other's nonsense um, is hidden from you as a child. So th the, the idea is that this psychological predisposition to believe your parents is, is the predisposition which leads to, re to religions, which then, um, I mean, nonsense as well as sense, gets passed down through the generations. It's different nonsense in different places, of course, which is exactly what you'd expect. Uh, in, I mean, it's... The, the Islamic nonsense is different from Christian nonsense, and that's just what you'd expect, just as different languages are different in different, in different areas. They tend to get passed down the generations from parent to, 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 to child. Um, so that, that's one example of a, pre, of a psychological predisposition. And another one, I think, is quite interesting, and I thought of that more recently than I, the, the, that one is mentioned in The God Delusion. The, this one is not. Um, a tendency to feel gratitude. Um, we are incredibly social animals, as I said before, and, and when somebody does you a good turn, it's important to be grateful. You, it's important to pay back the favor and to express your gratitude. And that, I suggest, might generalize the psychological predisp predisposition to feel grateful when something good happens to you might generalize from feeling grateful when a person does something good for you and when the weather does, say. Uh, when, um, a, when, a, when an accident happens, when there's an earthquake and your child doesn't die, you feel grateful. And you feel the need to, to be grateful to something or somebody. And, that, and you can't feel grateful to other people because they're not responsible for the weather. So you, so you can conjure up a fictitious person to feel uh, grateful to. And that's a special case, really, of the idea that it's good survival practice to suspect agents in nature. A lot of what happens in nature doesn't have an agent deliberately causing it. A lot of it is the weather, a lot of it is the wind, um, a lot of it is just plain accidents that, that happen. But when there are agents around, and where those agents might be lions or leopards or crocodiles who might be lurking in wait for you, or might be stalking you, then it's important for your survival to attribute agency to things. And that may generalize even to places where there's no agency. And I've often used the example of uh, a rustling in the long grass which could be the wind, is actually most likely to be the wind, but which could be a lion. And although the odds are that it's the wind, uh, your best bet is probably to assume that it's a lion, because if you get the bet wrong, um, it, it, if, if you bet on it being the wind and your bet is wrong, that, then that, that's, that's rather tragic. Um, <laughs> so, um, there may be a psychological predisposition to in invent agencies, invent agents where there aren't any. And this then, this same psychological predisposition generalizes itself 
to wind gods and thunder gods and, and lightning gods and river gods and, and, and sea gods and things like that, which then become merged later on in cultural evolution into the gods, into the named gods like Thor and Zeus and Apollo and Yahweh. Well, we're gonna, we have a number of questions that fall in the political correctness and challenge thereof category. So we'll kind of put a few of these together for the sake of time. Uh, first, do you believe feminism makes a positive contribution um, conducive to an open and scientific environment? And then there's a question also asking for your thoughts on the men's rights movement. So uh, let's kind of take both of those together on your thoughts on, on the contributions of feminism and then your thoughts on the men's rights movement. Uh, well, of, of, of course feminism plays an enormously important role. Um, feminism, as I understand it, is the political drive towards the equality of women. So that, that women should not be discriminated against, nobody should be discriminated against on grounds that don't merit discrimination. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, fem feminism is enormously important and is a political movement which uh, deserves to be um, thoroughly well supported. I don't, I didn't, I hardly knew there was. Is there a men's rights movement? I mean, if, if that... uh, I, I, if, I tend if, to think it's in this country right now, it's, it's a bit, or at well, least let's say at this campus, it's a bit timely right now. It, the is it, well, I, I know nothing about that, but, but I mean, if, if, there is dis, if there is discrimination against men, then that's bad too. I don't know whether there is. I haven't heard of it. Um, there, there's certainly dis, um, but, but, but if, if there is discrimination against men um, or against any uh, category like that of, of something that, um, something by, by which you can label a person, discrimination against, against gay people as, as well, for example, then it is to be deplored. Uh, what is your opinion on same-sex marriage and is it against the evolution principle? I don't care what's against the evolution principle. I'm, I'm all for, for going against the evolution principle. Um, evolution, by natural selection, is the explanation for why we exist. It is not something to guide our lives in our own society. If we were to be guided by the evolution principle, then we would be living in a kind of ultra-Thatcherite, Reaganite um, <laughs> society. Um, study your Darwinism for two reasons, because it explains why you're here, and, for the, and the second reason is study your Darwinism in order to learn what to avoid in setting up society. What we need is a truly anti-Darwinian society anti-Darwinian in the sense that we do, do not wish to live in a society where the weakest go to the wall, where the strongest suppress the weak, even kill the weak. Um, we do not, I at least, do not wish to live in that kind of society. I want to live in a sort of society where we take care of the sick, uh, where we take care of the weak, take care of the oppressed, which is a very anti-Darwinian society. So. <laughs> So I think that's your answer. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we have one. As an active member in the atheist community, I've noticed that it is far more effective if you wish to raise consciousness to act calm and kind when refuting theist arguments. However, we have prominent proponents in our community that act hostile and condescending. In your experience, what is the most successful way to raise consciousness within theists and those uninterested in, in science? Um, by race consciousness, I mean race consciousness about skepticism in science. Yes. Um, superficially, it's obvious that um, adopting, uh, that uh, super, superficially, it's obvious that if you tell somebody you're an idiot, um, he's not going to be persuaded. Um, and um, so that, that's undeniable. And if, if, if I was trying to persuade any one of you to give up your religion. I would not begin by saying you're an idiot. There is a difference, however, between persuading a particular individual, which is, which is one thing, and um, talking about a belief system which you think is ridiculous, um, 
which may affront and offend people who are very, very uh, wedded to that belief system. But if there are a lot of other people listening in or reading the article that you've just written, then you may actually influence them in a way that you would not influence the dyed-in-the-wool believer. Um, th this reflection occurs to me when I, I, do, I do a fair num amount of sort of radio um, pr programs in, in this country, among others, where, where you do have phone-ins, people phone in and, and um, ask me questions. And I get a fair number of naive young earth creationists. Um, and I don't pull my punches with them. Um, I do tell them their beliefs are ridiculous. I, I don't say you're a ridiculous individual. Um, I, I'm of the school of thought of the British journalist Johan Hari, who said, I respect you as an individual too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. <laughs> but I do, um, I do ridicule their ridiculous beliefs in the case of young earth creationism, who think the world is only 6,000 years old, which, by the way, is equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is eight yards. <laughs> That's the scale of the error. But I have in mind that I'm not just talking to this one person who's phoned in. I'm talking to the hundreds, maybe thousands of radio listeners who probably haven't thought about it very much. They probably just vaguely thought of themselves as Christian because that's the way their parents were, but haven't actually given it very much thought. And so, um, it, it, I'm, I'm not, the point I make is I'm not just trying to persuade the one individual that, I, that I'm talking about, that I, sorry, that I'm talking to. Um, even the one individual may be persuaded. I, I myself was persuaded by the same Peter Meadower whom I mentioned earlier. I, as an undergraduate, was very taken by a French theologian, Jesuit priest, called Teilhard de Chardin, who wrote a book called The Phenomenon of Man, which um, I was very seduced by what Medower called that tipsy, euphoristic prose poetry, which is one of the more tiresome manifestations of the French spirit. <laughs> That's vintage Medower, by the way. That, that strain of patrician arrogance. Um, but I was seduced by Teilhard de Chardin. I, lo I loved it. I loved the prose poetry and uh, thought this was a, a wonderful, great book. Then I read Meadower's review of the book, uh, which is probably the greatest negative book review ever written, and was completely, and, and, and I said, I've been a fool. I was, I was taken in. I, I've been an idiot. And so in, that, in my case, I, I, di I wasn't uh, turned off by having my cherished beliefs ridiculed. But I think it's probably, I think the, the main argument is that you're not necessarily trying to change the, the belief of the one person. You may be trying to raise consciousness more generally than that. So I, I think a question that works as a little bit of a follow-up to this, have you ever considered that the manner in which you present your atheism, atheism pushes people back into their respective religions? It's, it's the same question, I think. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Quick time check, too. How are we doing? Well, perhaps I could say one thing about that. It, it, it would be actually illogical to be pushed back into your religion. It might be, uh, it might be reasonable to be, to be offended and just sort of walk off in a half. But to actually have your faith strengthened by an argument against it, uh, that doesn't strike me as terribly logical. <laughs> so I, I think we've come to the end of our time. And to, to close up as we, as we wrap up, um, I think I, I would love to hear you share with us if you had to identify um, the greatest achievement of your career and maybe what you might consider your greatest failure? What would those be? Uh, my greatest achievement, such as it is, and I don't want to claim that it's all that great, um, in science is probably um, my, my second book, The Extended Phenotype, which was the only book I've written 
specifically for a professional audience, although I like to think it can be read by, um, uh, by anybody who takes the trouble. Um, I suppose I, I would also like to make some claim for um, my whole corpus of books written for lay people, which people tell me uh, have influenced them and they've, they've learned from. So uh, scientific achievement would be the extended phenotype and public achievement would be really all, 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 all my other books, I suppose. My greatest failure, I have failures which I think are private. <laughs> Well, it has been an incredible honor, and it has been a wonderful experience being able to have a conversation with you this evening. Thank you all for being here for your insightful questions. Um, I believe we have a book signing opportunity out in the lobby after this, so please do stick around. Um, and with that, uh, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed.